Okay, so welcome everyone um, uh, to this uh, session uh, that I'm very happy to chair for a number of reasons. Um, and I think without further ado, uh, we want to leave as much time as possible for the actual talks. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to uh, leave the stage to Jason Miller from the University of Cambridge. And he's going to talk to us about UVL quantum gravity and its uh, two incarnations. Uh, uh, thank you. So I'm very happy to be here today. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is based on uh, a series of works I've done in collaboration with, uh, with Scott Sheffield from MIT. And um, so what is the basic idea? So the question is, how do you make rigorous sense of what it would mean to pick um, a surface uniformly at random, which is homeomorphic uh, to the sphere? Um, so there have been uh, two different approaches to this question which have been developed over the years. Um, so the first one is uh, a discrete approach. These are what are called random planar maps. And these are rooted in the combinatorics literature going back to the 1960s. And there's a second approach, um, which is very different, at least on the surface, uh, but very natural from the perspective of complex analysis or geometry. And this is called Leoville quantum gravity. And this is something which is rooted in the physics literature uh, from the 1980s. And the main result is going to be that these two objects uh, ultimately describe uh, the same thing. And the mathematical tools which are going to go into this involve things like the schramm leuven revolution, uh, the percolation model, and also classical growth models from probability like the Eden model or diffusion-limited aggregation. Um, OK, so let me begin by uh, telling you about random planar maps. And the uh, first most basic definition is what is a planar map? Uh, so this is just a graph uh, together with an embedding in the plane uh, so that no two edges cross. And uh, the faces of a planar map are the connected components of the complement of its edges. And there are many different types of planar maps that you can talk about. But one particularly nice example is a quadrangulation. And this just means that each one of your faces uh, has exactly uh, four uh, adjacent edges. And in this talk, uh, I want to think of a quadrangulation as corresponding to a metric space, where here the notion of distance just comes from the, uh, the underlying uh, graph distance. And when you uh, fix the number of faces in your map, so let's say you have n faces, then there are only a finite number of possible quadrangulations, and so you can pick one uniformly at random. And for me, this is going to be uh, a random planar map, okay? a uniformly random quadrangulation. Um, so these objects have a huge history. Uh, this goes back to work of Tut uh, back in the 1960s when he was trying to prove the four-color theorem. And in these last uh, 60 or so years, uh, people have been looking at planar maps from many different perspectives. Uh, for example, uh, in the combinatorics literature, uh, people like to count different types of planar maps and prove enum enumeration formulas. Uh, in the physics literature, what people do is they take different types of models from uh, statistical mechanics, like the, the percolation model, the easing model, uh, et cetera, and study it uh, on top of a planar map. And from the probability perspective, they're very natural because you can think of uniformly random planar maps as discretizing the question of what it would mean to pick uh, a surface uh, uniformly at random. And the limit, you would expect to get a kind of uh, Brownian surface. Um, so this is one of my favorite pictures of what a random quadrangulation uh, looks like. Uh, this is something which I borrowed from uh, Bertrand Duplantier. And uh, what this uh, piece of origami shows you are a bunch of squares um, which have been folded together to form something which is uh, topologically uh, a sphere. Now, it looks a little bit like this is not really a quadrangulation because you see these uh, what look like triangles sticking out here in the top. But all that's going on is that one side of a given uh, quadrilateral has been glued to uh, one of its other sides. And then you get something that looks like a triangle. And again, uh, the basic question to understand is, what is the structure of a uniformly random quadrangulation look like when you make the number of faces uh, very, very large? And in order to start to address this question, uh, there's a more basic question, which is just the counting question. So how many of them are there when you fix the number of faces? And this is something which was uh, derived by Tut in his uh, original series of papers on planar maps uh, from the 60s. And there's a very simple formula, and, uh, and here it is. Okay, 
Um, here's one more simulation. Uh, this is a, a much larger uh, instance of a random quadrangulation. So in this case, this has uh, 25,000 faces. And the random quadrangulation has then been embedded into three-dimensional space uh, using Mathematica. This embedding is a highly non-isometric embedding. And so distances here really are being stretched and contracted uh, quite a lot. Um, but I think that these kinds of pictures are very important to look at because they remind us that when you choose surfaces at random, uh, you don't get nice, smooth uh, manifolds. Rather, you're going to get something which is a very rough uh, fractal object. Um, and this particular picture, this is due to uh, Jean-Francois Mackert. Uh, he's someone who did uh, some of the very important work on random quadrangulations uh, about 10 or 15 years ago. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to tell you about uh, some of the basic results uh, for the structure of uniformly random quadrangulations. Um, so the first one is due to uh, Schasing and Schaefer. And what it says is that if you choose a quadrangulation uniformly at random with n faces, then the diameter, the metric space diameter, is going to be of the order uh, n to the one quarter. And this result is very important because it tells you what the right scaling factor is going to be if you want to scale distances and try to get some kind of continuous object uh, in the limit. And after this work, uh, Jean-Francois Legault showed that if you, in fact, perform this scaling, n to the minus one quarter, then at the very least, you can take subsequential limits, and you're going to get some kind of subsequentially limiting uh, random metric space. And it took really a long time before people were able to go beyond uh, these uh, subsequential limits. But in the intervening years, uh, they were able to prove some very uh, interesting things. Uh, so for example, it was shown by Jean-Francois Legault that what you're going to get is always going to have a uh, Hausdorff dimension uh, equal to four. But at the same time, uh, it's going to be homeomorphic to the two-dimensional sphere. Uh, so this last result was actually proved in two different works. Uh, there's one due to uh, Legal and Pollen, and another one due to uh, Gregory Miermont. And all of these works uh, culminated um, uh, about uh, six years ago, when uh, there were two works that were produced, uh, one due to Legal and another one due to Miermont, where they showed that it's not necessary to pass uh, along a subsequential limit. You actually have a real uh, limiting object, and this is what's now known as the Brownian map or the Brownian sphere. Okay, so this is a random uh, metric space, which is homeomorphic to the sphere, but has uh, Hausdorff dimension uh, four. And one thing that I want to emphasize is that the Brownian map is not just a random metric space, it's actually a random metric measure space. And this, uh, this measure, which is sitting on it, uh, where it arises is it's in the most natural way, namely it's just the limit of the measure which assigns uh, one unit of mass to each one of the faces in your, uh, your planar map. Okay, okay so this is um, one uh, way of thinking of picking surfaces at random. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about a completely different one. And the starting point for this one is the classical uniformization theorem. And what this tells you, uh, just to remind you, is that if you have any Riemann surface, which is homeomorphic to the disk, the plane, or the sphere, uh, can always be conformally mapped to whichever one it's topologically uh, equivalent to. And the point is that uh, when you take the metric for your surface, and you put it into coordinates using this particular conformal map, then it takes a very nice form. Namely, it's given by perturbing the Euclidean metric by this uh, conformal factor, uh, e to the rho, where this is a, a smooth function. And one way of thinking about this is that this tells you that you can parameterize the entire space of surfaces, which are homeomorphic to the disk, the plane, or the sphere, uh, in terms of the set of smooth functions. And if you choose your function to be just the zero function, then you're going to recover uh, your original surface. And more generally, if you take your function to be harmonic, uh, then what you're going to do is you're going to get a surface which is like uh, a planar domain. And so if you want to use um, you know, this perspective to uh, talk about a theory of random surfaces, the question that you have to answer is you need to decide what is the right measure on uh, functions rho. And in particular, if you want to think of your random surface as being a canonical perturbation of a flat surface, then the right thing to do is to take your function rho to be the canonical perturbation of a, a harmonic function. And in probability theory, uh, that has a name. That's the Gaussian free field. Okay. So in Lieville quantum gravity, 
uh, what you're going to do is you're going to take your, your uh, conformal factor to come from the Gaussian free field. And just to remind you how that's defined, this is a random Gaussian field, which is indexed by the points on a planar domain. And the covariance function for your free field is just given by the Green's function for the, um, the Laplacian on your domain. And beyond being you know, the canonical perturbation of a harmonic function, it's also very important because it's a conformally invariant and Markovian field. And again, how is um, Liouville quantum gravity defined? Oops. So Liouville quantum gravity, this is going to be the random surface where you take your conformal factor to be given by a parameter gamma times an instance uh, h of the Gaussian free field. Okay? And this uh, parameter gamma is something that you can change, and it's going to dictate how rough uh, the surface that you're getting uh, actually is. Um, so this model was introduced by uh, Polyakov back in the 1980s, in 1981. Um, but from a mathematical perspective, uh, Lievo quantum gravity does not make rigorous sense because this uh, H, the free field that we're exponentiating here, is not uh, a function, rather it's a distribution, and you cannot uh, exponentiate um, distributions. Um, now, the study of Lievo quantum gravity uh, has become uh, a big topic in probability theory over the last uh, 10 or so years. Uh, this is something that was really kicked off in this work of uh, Duplantier and Sheffield. And what they did, among other things, is they showed that it's possible to construct the volume form associated with Liouville quantum gravity. And basically what this means is that you have some way of calculating you know, areas of regions. You can also calculate uh, lengths of curves, but you don't have uh, a notion of distance. And the way that the construction goes is you just take you know, what would be the volume form associated with this metric, and you construct it by replacing the free field with an appropriately mollified version and then take a limit as the, uh, as, the, uh, as the mollification goes to zero. And I should mention that measures of this type have been considered in lots of other places. For example, they also go back to this uh, much earlier work of Kahan, and there's also been uh, a lot of work on this topic by, uh, by Rose and Vargas. Now, over here on the right-hand side, I'm just trying to illustrate to you uh, what these surfaces look like for different values of gamma. So for example, here at gamma 1.5, I'm showing you a bunch of squares, and each square has approximately the same size in the, uh, in, with respect to this uh, random uh, metric. And so there are these regions, like this square here, which are much larger in the Euclidean sense as one of these other microscopic squares here, even though in the quantum sense they have uh, approximately the same, same size. Okay? So again, you're getting a very rough and fractal uh, singular um, object. OK, so that's um, Liouville quantum gravity. Um, so what I've tried to convince you of is that you have two canonical and very natural ways of picking surfaces at random. Uh, they're both very well motivated from uh, different perspectives. You have Liouville quantum gravity and the Brownian map. And again, just to remind you, Liouville quantum gravity is the random Riemann surface given by perturbing the Euclidean metric by e to the gamma h, where h is a Gaussian free field. And previously, this was only uh, constructed as a random area measure, and it was done using this uh, regularization procedure. But one thing that I also want to emphasize is that beyond uh, just being an area measure, uh, Levo quantum gravity comes with the extra structure of a conformal structure because it's embedded uh, into the plane. And so what this means is that you can calculate you know, angles between curves, uh, et cetera. And in contrast, uh, the Brownian map is, at least a priori, a very different object because it's just a random metric measure space and it does not obviously come with an embedding into the uh, plane. Okay? And so what this talk is about is it's about taking each one of these objects and you want to equip it with the other one's structure and then show that what you're going to get is exactly the same. Okay. Um, so one thing I want to mention is that it's been believed for a long time uh, that there should be uh, a natural way of taking the Brownian map and embedding it into the uh, sphere so that what you get is a form of Liouville quantum gravity where the parameter gamma has to be taken to be uh, exactly the square root of eight thirds. And there are a number of different ways of approaching this question. Uh, one very natural way to try to do it is to try to um, discretize it. And the way that you would discretize this question is you would take, for example, a random quadrangulation, which is discretizing your Brownian map. And then once you have this object, there are lots of ways to embed it in the plane. 
Uh, so for example, you can do this using uh, circle packing, which is what I'm showing here on the right-hand side, but there are also other uh, natural choices, like you could use Riemann uniformization or some kind of discrete form of it. And then it's supposed to be true that as you send the size of your quadrangulation to infinity, uh, what you have here on the right-hand side is converging to a form of Liouville quantum gravity with the parameter uh, gamma equals the square root of eight-thirds. Now, this is uh, not the approach that I'm going to be describing today. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to work purely uh, in the continuum. OK, so what is the main result? Uh, so the main result is that Liouville quantum gravity and the Brownian map are exactly equivalent. And the way that the argument is going to go is that we're going to take Liouville quantum gravity, where gamma is the square root of 8 thirds, and put uh, a metric on top of it, which is going to be uh, isometric to the Brownian map. Um, let me make a couple of comments about this. Um, so first of all, again, this is going to be purely a continuum construction. There won't be any discrete approximations. And uh, also, um, the ideas to build it are going to be a bit indirect, and they're going to be connected to um, some classical aggregation models that you have in probability, like the Eden growth model and also um, diffusion-limited uh, aggregation. Okay? Um, okay, so that's, that's the main result. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to tell you about one of the uh, very important mathematical tools uh, which goes into proving this, and this is the, um, the schramm levin revolution. Okay, so the schramm levin revolution, uh, very roughly, uh, this is a, a random fractal curve which lives in a planar domain. And this was um, introduced by Odid Schramm about 20 years ago. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to describe scaling limits of interfaces in different types of uh, discrete models. And one of the main examples is the uh, percolation model, which is what I'm showing you here. And again, what you want to do is you want to understand uh, what the geometry is of the interfaces between the uh, hexagons, which are red and are black. Okay? And you want to know in particular what happens when you send uh, the size of your uh, hexagons to zero. You would expect to get some kind of a limiting path. And what Schramm realized is that once you make uh, a couple of uh, assumptions, namely if you assume that you're going to have a conformally invariant curve, which satisfies a very natural Markov property, then this makes it so that there's essentially just one possibility. And this is what uh, SLE is. And it's defined up to a single parameter. Uh, this is called uh, kappa. And when you vary the value of kappa, you get a curve which uh, actually looks very different. Uh, so for example, when the parameter kappa is between 0 and 4, you're going to have a simple curve. When kappa is between 4 and 8, it becomes a self-intersecting curve. And finally, when kappa goes uh, above 8, what you're going to get is uh, a random uh, space-filling curve. And the dimension has computed, been computed uh, by Vincent Buffera. It's a very simple formula. It's just 1 plus uh, kappa over 8. And there are lots of uh, very special kappa values, which correspond to different types of discrete models. Um, so some of the very famous examples include loop erased random walk in the uniform spanning tree, uh, the self-avoiding walk, the easing model, uh, et cetera. And in this particular talk, the value of kappa, which is going to be most important for us, is going to be kappa equals 6 because this is the one which uh, Smirnoff proved corresponds to the scaling limit of this, uh, this percolation uh, interface. Okay? So I want to take a moment just to uh, remind you how uh, SLE is defined, because the definition is something which is uh, very interesting. Um, so it starts by using uh, a classical tool from complex analysis from the 1920s. This is called the, uh, the Lovner equation. And what this is, is it's a way of taking a curve and encoding it, a curve in the upper half plane, and encoding it by a, a real valued function. So the way it works is you imagine you have your curve, let's say eta, and you can always grow this up to some time t. And once you've done that, you can take the complement of your curve, and you can conformally map that back to the uh, upper half plane. And of course, there are lots of choices for your conformal transformation, but you can fix your choice by insisting that it looks like the uh, identity at infinity. And what comes out of this theorem is that these conformal maps satisfy a very nice uh, differential equation. And the input into this differential equation is this uh, real-valued uh, continuous function uh, w. Okay? 
And so, again, what this is about is it's about taking a, a curve in the upper half plane and encoding it by something which seems much simpler, uh, namely this uh, continuous function uh, w. And SLE is the object which arises when you make a very special choice of w, namely you want it to be a positive multiple of uh, a standard Brownian motion. Okay? And this is how it's defined uh, in the upper half plane. And for other domains, the way that SLE is constructed is you just apply a conformal transformation to what you got uh, in the upper half plane case. OK, so that's the Schrambovn revolution. So now what I want to do is I want to explain to you some of the ideas and intuition behind this uh, result, which relates these two types of random surfaces. Um, as I said before, all of the action somehow takes place purely in the continuum, but all of the ideas for how to construct it and build it are purely discrete and so I want to uh, explain this, uh, this discrete intuition. And the starting point is, again, this classical model from probability theory. This is the Eden growth model. And the way it works is that you imagine that you have a graph, like this piece of Z2, and you're going to define a random glowing cluster. And so you can imagine, for example, that your cluster starts off with this initial vertex here, this blue vertex. And then the way it's going to grow is you look at each of the vertices which is adjacent to it, and you just pick one uniformly at random from these four possibilities, and then you add it to your cluster. So for example, you could choose this one here as your first choice, and then you're going to continue. So now you have uh, six uh, red vertices which are adjacent to these two guys. You choose one at random, and you add it to your uh, cluster. And if you keep doing this, you're going to get this uh, growth And the uh, big question, which has been around for a long time, is to try to understand uh, what this model looks like uh, after you've added uh, a large number of particles. Um, so here's a, a picture of the Eden model. So this is what it looks like on Z2 with uh, a large number of particles. And one of the basic results about the large-scale behavior of the Eden model, uh, which goes back to Cox and Durrett in 1981, is that the macroscopic shape that you see here uh, actually looks like uh, something which is uh, convex, okay? And not only, um, you know, not only is it convex, but you could start to wonder whether or not maybe it is just exactly the same thing as a Euclidean disk, okay? Um, but, you know, these days we can do very large computer simulations, and if you look at this picture here, this quite clearly does not look like a Euclidean disk. And the reason that you don't get a disk is that the lattice that we're working on, the two-dimensional integer lattice, this has special directions. So it's very different to travel up than it is to sort of go up, over, up, over, uh, et cetera. And so you get something which is uh, not recovering the Euclidean metric. Um, but the point is that when you go to a random geometry, like a random planar map or Leo quantum gravity, you are not going to have special directions, and you would expect that this type of procedure might actually uh, recover for you the original uh, metric. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to explain uh, why the Eden model is actually a very nice thing to look at when you work on a random uh, planar map. So I want you to imagine that you have a random, in this case, triangulation, okay? And the gray part, this is something that I have not revealed to you yet, and I'm going to uh, perform uh, an Eden growth on this random um, triangulation. And so again, the way that it's going to work is I'm going to look at each of the edges on the boundary of my cluster, I'm going to choose one at random, and then I'm going to add to my cluster the opposing triangle. So for example, I could add uh, this one here. And then I'm just going to continue. Uh, perhaps I get this triangle. And every once in a while, uh, something like this is going to happen, where you see a, a triangle which is attached to the uh, original cluster, and you're going to separate the planar map uh, into two pieces. But that's perfectly fine. Um, so the point, and the reason that this is really nice, is that because my planar map was chosen uniformly at random, I can describe exactly what the conditional law is of all of the, uh, all of the holes, okay? And in particular, the conditional law of each one of these holes is just going to depend on the boundary length of the component, and it's very simple to describe. So what this means is that this type of exploration uh, respects the Markovian structure of your, um, your planar map. And again, um, because this is a random object, it's very natural to believe that at very large scales, this type of growth process actually is going to be recovering your uh, original metric. And uh, this intuition was later uh, proved or made precise uh, in a work of uh, Kurian and, uh, and Legal.
Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I want to use this idea to try to make sense of first passage percolation purely in the continuum on top of Liouville quantum gravity. And in order to motivate that, I'm going to try to describe to you a variant of the Eden model. And this is going to be a little bit different than before because I want to use uh, only operations that I know how to do in the continuum. And in the continuum, the two natural things that I know how to do is I can pick points according to boundary length using the Liouville quantum gravity measure. And I also know how to draw pieces of percolation interfaces because I know, uh, I know what SLE6 is. Okay? And so how does this work? So here I have my, my planar map again. And the way that I'm going to grow my cluster is I'm going to pick two edges uh, at random uh, on the boundary. And then I'm going to color uh, one side of my cluster blue. And the other side I'm going to color yellow. And then I'm going to color the rest of the map, uh, either blue or yellow, independently with probability 1 half um, to get a percolation configuration. And then I'm going to expand my cluster by attaching to it a bit of this uh, percolation uh, interface. OK, so this is one step in the growth process. And then I'm going to continue it by forgetting the colors and then just repeating the same thing. So I'm going to pick two edges uh, at random on the boundary of my cluster. I'm going to color one side of it blue and the other side of it yellow. I'm going to do percolation in the rest of the map and then add to my cluster a bit of this uh, percolation interface, uh, et cetera. Okay. And the point is that uh, this particular exploration, uh, this is something which also uh, respects the Markovian structure of the map. So you can describe uh, exactly what's going on. So you know exactly the law of the holes that you're cutting off. You also know exactly how the, the overall boundary length of the cluster is changing. And what you would expect is that at very large scales, you know, if you do this variant of the Eden model rather than the original Eden model, it's not really going to change things. And the reason is that you know, the kind of macroscopic picture should not depend on this, uh, this microscopic um, change. OK. Um, so I want to explain now why this is a, a good idea. And the reason is that you can make the following ansatz, which says that if you take a random planar map, and you uh, pick two edges at random, and then you do percolation uh, inside of your map, then you can construct uh, the percolation uh, interface, which connects these two edges. Then again, what's supposed to be true is that if you take this picture and you can formally map it over to the sphere, then in the limit, the, the surface, the embedded surface, is supposed to be converging to a square root 8 thirds Liouville quantum gravity surface, and at the same time, the percolation interface, this is supposed to be converging to an SLE6, which is independent of the, uh, the Liouville quantum gravity surface. OK? And OK, so this is now, this is all intuition. And then the question is, how do you do this uh, purely in the, uh, in the continuum? OK? So we want to make sense of percolation in the continuum on top of a random planar map. And so the starting point is you imagine that you have a square root 8 thirds Liouville quantum gravity surface. That's going to play the role of the random planar map. And the percolation interface uh, is going to be played by an SLE 6 curve, which is sampled independently of the square root 8 thirds Liouville quantum gravity surface. And then what you want to do is you want to understand what's happening uh, inside of this uh, picture. Okay? And it turns out that um, you can describe exactly what's going on. So you have all of these, uh, these disks, for example, which are cut out by your percolation interface. And what you can show is that this collection of disks actually has an exact uh, Poissonian structure, just like the holes which are cut out by a percolation exploration on top of a random planar map have an exact uh, IID structure. And this type of uh, result, or this sort of idea, this sort of uh, first goes back to a very influential paper in the field, uh, the quantum gravity uh, zipper paper due to Scott Sheffield. And the types of results here, uh, which are very important for the metric construction, are proved in this paper, uh, Lieville quantum gravity as a mating of trees, with Bertrand Duplantier and Scott Sheffield. Now, one thing I want to emphasize is that these types of statements are not at all obvious when you look at the definition of SLE or the Gaussian free field. The way that you sort of guess these things are going to be true is that you look at your discrete model, you see what's exactly true, and then you just guess that exactly the same thing is going to work here. Uh, and it turns out to be um, the case. Okay?
Now, one thing which is very important here is that in order for these types of statements to work, it absolutely must be true that the parameter gamma for your Liouville quantum gravity surface has to be related to kappa using this particular relationship here. So it's either the square root of kappa or 4 over the square root of kappa. And so in particular, when you want to do kappa equals 6, so the percolation model, then this forces you to choose gamma equal to the square root of 8 thirds. And this is one of the mathematical ways of seeing that square root 8 thirds Liouville quantum gravity is kind of the only option to describe um, the Brownian map. OK. So I want to describe to you now how the metric construction works. So we're going to do first passage percolation in the continuum. So we imagine we have our Liouville quantum gravity surface. We have a starting point where we're going to grow our cluster. And the way that we're going to grow it is we're just going to draw a little bit of SLE6. This is like drawing a little bit of percolation interface. Then we're going to resample uh, the tip according to boundary length. This is just like resampling the two edges. And then we're going to attach a bit more percolation interface. And if we keep doing this, we are going to get a, a growth model. And this growth model is just like uh, the Eden model, um, but in the continuum. And the point is that because we understand exactly what happens when you put SLE6 on top of Liouville quantum gravity, we also know exactly what happens here when we do this modified uh, exploration uh, on top of uh, Liouville quantum gravity. And and then what you do is you take a limit as the size of these chunks are going to zero, and then you get a process that we call the quantum Leuven revolution with parameters 8 thirds and zero, and it turns out that this object uh, actually does describe uh, a growing metric ball in a random metric space which is isometric to um, the Brownian map. Now, this is something which is not at all obvious from how these things are defined, uh, it makes a lot of sense and it's intuitive because of the stories that I told you earlier, but there's actually quite a bit of work that goes into to doing this. And this is what's carried out uh, in these, uh, these four papers, uh, Levo quantum gravity in the Brownian map one through three and the, uh, the axiomatic characterization uh, of the Brownian map. Um, just to give you a sense, um, this is a, 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 oops. This is a picture of what these uh, quantum Leuven revolutions look like. And so this is uh, showing you a metric ball on, on square root 8 thirds uh, Liouville quantum gravity. Um, OK, so in the remaining time, uh, what I want to do is I want to tell you um, a bit more about these uh, QLE processes. So this is actually a whole family of uh, growth models. Um, and we index it by the parameters gamma squared and eta where here gamma tells you what type of Liouville quantum gravity surface you are growing on, and eta tells you uh, how the growth process is actually growing. And the way that it works is that you imagine that you have your harmonic measure and length measure on your surface, and you add uh, microscopic particles using the measure which is given by the length measure and weighting it by the radonicotium derivative between the harmonic measure and the length measure to the uh, eightth power. So this is something which is very natural, because when you take eta equal to zero, then you're just adding particles according to the boundary length measure. And this is exactly the uh, Eden model. When eta is equal to one, then um, the length measure term cancels, and you're adding particles according to harmonic measure. And this is diffusion-limited aggregation, or DLA. And for general values of eta, uh, this model has a name, and it's something which is called the, uh, the dielectric breakdown model. OK, so let me tell you uh, just a few words about uh, diffusion-limited aggregation. Um, so this was something which was invented uh, almost 40 years ago uh, by Witten and Sander, uh, 1981. And uh, I'm sure you've seen you know, pictures of these types of, of random ferns. And it turns out that this is actually something which is extremely difficult to analyze uh, mathematically. So in these last uh, 37 years since DLA has been uh, invented, people haven't really been able to prove uh, anything about it, okay? So some of the most basic questions about DLA that we can't answer include, you know, what, are, what is the fractal dimension of this? There are very precise simulations which have been done. They say it's supposed to be about 1.71, but we don't know how to prove it. Uh, we also don't know how to mathematically describe uh, diffusion-limited aggregation at large scales, so take some kind of scaling limit. We also don't know whether or not diffusion-limited aggregation is random or deterministic at very large scales. Uh, pretty much everything about it is, um, is open. Okay, But using this construction, uh, we can build a version of DLA, which turns out to be tractable to analyze. 
uh, namely diffusion-limited aggregation on a square root two uh, Liouville quantum gravity surface. Okay, so this is DLA inside of a random medium, and what you see is something that looks a little bit like DLA, but perhaps more like a cousin rather than a brother. Um, and the reason it's different is that somehow this growing cluster has to interact with your random medium. And so what happens is it tends to concentrate itself in the valleys of the surface and it has to avoid um, the mountains. Okay. Um, so right now um, we can construct these QLE processes only for certain choices of parameters. That's when these um, uh, pairs, gamma squared and eta, lie on one of these uh, two orange curves. The way that the process is built is by using the SLE process and performing this transformation, which we call tip re-randomization. Uh, and it's just a generalization of what I described to you earlier in the case of the, um, the Eden model. But the two very special values that we know how to uh, understand are 8 thirds zero, because this is giving us the metric space structure on Levo quantum gravity, and 2 comma 1, because this is the first sort of continuum description of a diffusion limit and aggregation uh, model. Now, the reason that we have exactly uh, two values of uh, eta for each value of gamma is because there are two values of kappa for your SLE, which are somehow compatible with each value of uh, gamma. And of course, we would like to be able to extend this construction to go to the entire um, eta gamma plane, because then possibly we might be able to address uh, what's happening for regular uh, Euclidean uh, DLA. OK, so um, what I want to do in these last few minutes is to tell you a little bit about where we are now in this general theory. Um, so once you have a metric for Liouville quantum gravity, then you can start to prove different types of scaling limits for random planar maps. And I want to mention first uh, two of them. So in two works, uh, both with uh, you and Gwyn, we've shown that self-avoiding walks on random planar maps converge to SLE 8 thirds on square root 8 thirds Liouville quantum gravity. And we've also proved that the percolation model on random planar maps converges to SLE 6 on top of Liouville quantum gravity. Um, now, these are not the first scaling limit results uh, for a statistical mechanics model towards SLE on Liouville quantum gravity. There are a number of other ones which were proved uh, previously, um, but the difference between these types of results has to do with the uh, topology. So these first two results are really about the metric topology or the notion of distance, and that's why you need a metric on square root 8 thirds Liouville quantum gravity, whereas the kind of topology which uh, is, is uh, underlying uh, these results, this has to do with uh, things which describe the loops of your statistical mechanics model, their topology, how they're glued together, uh, et cetera, but you don't have this, um, this notion of uh, distance. Um, and then finally, uh, we have one other uh, relatively recent work where we've shown that uh, a special type of random planar map model, uh, when conformally embedded, does converge to, uh, to leave a quantum gravity. Okay, so in the last few minutes, um, I want to um, kind of explain what are some of the, the big open questions which are, are left uh, in this field. So the main one has to do with uh, understanding what happens when you take the value of gamma here uh, not to be uh, the square root of 8 thirds, but something else between 0 and 2. Um, so the other values of gamma are extremely natural uh, because what they correspond to are random planar maps but you have some extra structure, namely you have some kind of model from statistical mechanics, for example, an instance of the easing model or something else. And it turns out that uh, very little is known about the metric structure of Liouville quantum gravity once you take gamma not equal to the square root of 8 thirds. So at this point, you know, we have no idea how to go about constructing it. We have very um, little understanding as to how to go about uh, analyzing it. And just as an example of this, um, let me mention um, one, one particular question, which is the uh, Hausdorff dimension for Liouville quantum gravity for general values of gamma is something which is known. So when gamma is the square root of 8 thirds, you get a four-dimensional metric space, um, but you're going to get a different dimension when gamma is not equal to the square root of 8 thirds. And this has been something which has actually been a, a con kind of controversial thing uh, in this uh, area. So for example, there's been this uh, prediction, which is called the, the Watabiki prediction, because it was due to, to Watabiki back in the uh, early 90s. And he made this guess, 
that the dimension for Liouville quantum gravity for general values of gamma uh, is given by this, uh, this function here. And you know, this function does take on the right values for the two values of gamma that we know, namely when gamma is equal to zero, this actually gives you uh, two. So that's a good sign because Liouville quantum gravity when gamma is equal to zero is the same thing as a, a flat metric. And if you also plug in gamma equal to the square root of eight thirds, then you get four. So it agrees with our other data point. But again, uh, we don't know uh, what's supposed to be true for other values of gamma. There's been a lot of work on this uh, in recent years. For example, uh, Ding and Goswami have actually disproved the Wadabiki prediction when gamma is very small, so as gamma goes to zero. Um, but perhaps it's still true when gamma is large. And there have been some uh, very recent bounds, uh, which are due to uh, well, uh, several works by Ding, Gwyn, Zaituni, and Zhang, which are consistent with this Wadibiki prediction. And they, they, they're consistent with it uh, up to an error of about uh, 0.1. But we still don't really know whether or not uh, this is going to be uh, the, the correct answer. And so again, the metric structure for Liouville quantum gravity for other values of gamma is something which is uh, really, uh, really wide open. Okay, and I, I'll stop there. Thank you.